Hey, thanks so much for checking out today's message at Propel Church. We believe that God is moving powerfully in our church and we would love to connect with you. So be sure to hit the like button, comment, subscribe, even share. If you want to get connected, you can visit our website, propel.church. But for now, let's lean in, take notes and enjoy God's word. Today, we're in a message series called In Blank We Trust. Uh, Kind of the concept of this series came from the back of the dollar bills that you and I utilize, uh, which in bold letters says, In God We Trust. But the reality is, for many of us, we don't really trust God with our money. We trust the God of money. And so last weekend when we opened up the series, if you missed the message at all, it's available on our YouTube channel. What we talked about was in accumulation we trust. It was this idea that you and I have this belief based on what the world teaches us and the culture we live in, that the more we gain, the more stuff we have, the more valuable we are. But nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus would tell a parable that your value is not in what you own. Your value is actually in who you know, and the greatest thing you could have is not a a big house or a nice car. The best thing you could have is a relationship with God. And so we unpacked that last weekend, and this weekend, uh, I want to talk to you from the topic, in being rich, we trust. Now, I've jokingly told you from time to time that uh, Tori and I, when we first got married, uh, we were po. We were not poor because we couldn't afford the last two letters, you know, so we were po, beneath the poverty line. I remember when we first got married, uh, Tori, she was my sugar mama, right? She was the primary breadwinner uh, in our home in uh, January of 2014. We got married. We go on our honeymoon. And uh, we went to Pigeon Forge for a few days, had a great time. On our way home, uh, we're driving back in, and we had just crossed into North Carolina. And as soon as we get in North Carolina, she gets a phone call, and they let her know that she is being laid off of her job. Now, this was not a great time for us because we didn't have a lot of money anyway. She's the primary breadwinner. We've been married for four days now. And I'm sitting there in my car, and I don't know if you ever get in these moments. Anybody ever, like, internally panic, but you don't externally panic, you know? Like, this is what I'm going through. In my, in my internal side, I am freaking out. On the outside, I'm like, it's, it's going to be fine, you know? Everything's good, no problem at all. Internally, I'm going, what in the world are we going to do? And I remember that in that moment going, God, what do you want us to do? Because I'm going to be honest, uh, I didn't really, like, I signed up for the marriage. I didn't sign up for for the the hardships, you know what I'm saying? Because sometimes I think we have this idea that just because we follow the Lord, it means that everything's going to be smooth. And it doesn't work that way. So I go, God, what do you want us to do? And the challenge in that season was to not stop giving. And it was in that season where Tori and I learned what it looked like to really be rich. It was in that season where at the end of that year, after God gives us this challenge to not quit giving, my dad was doing our taxes at the time, and they were significantly less complicated than they are now. So he was doing our taxes then, and he came to me at the end of the year, and, and he said, hey, I don't, I don't want to do your taxes because you guys gave away over half of your income this year. How did you survive? I know how much you make. How did you survive? I go, I don't know. We just... God was so good to us. And I think as we talk about this idea of being rich, most of us in the room would not consider ourselves rich. If I were to say, are you rich? You would say, no, not at all. It's easy for us to look at the world because we we have such a social media focused uh, world that you go, "Well, well, to be rich means I have to have this and this and this and this. But according to uh, Google, the average household income is $54,000 combined, meaning that if your household income exceeds that, you would be considered rich. Now, you might be like, well, come on, that ain't us. And if that's the case, there are some who struggle in the world to even have a roof over their head. So so if you have a home, if you have a a roof over your head, you would be considered rich. Many of us don't just have a roof over our head. We have an entire room that our clothes live in. You'd be considered rich. 
Did you know that you're in the top 12% of wage earners in the world if you have a home that has a garage? Even your car has a house. Now, comparatively, we don't feel rich, but we are. And so as we dive into Scripture today, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 17. If you don't have a Bible, it's going to be available on the screen, or uh, we'd love to put a Bible in your hand. So at the end of the worship experience today, uh, stop by the Next Steps area. We'll give you a, this Bible. It's, it's, I, I stole one from them. I borrowed? Stole. Um, <laughs> I got one from them to show you. But we'd love to put one in your hands because we want you to have access to God's Word. If you're not familiar with First Timothy, Paul has been, he's been church planting all around the world, and then he's sending out pastors and church planters to lead these churches. And Paul is a mentor, and he's writing to his mentee, Timothy. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul is going to write a letter to encourage this young pastor. And this is what it says, 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 17. It says, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, they'll be storing up their treasure as a good fortune for the future so that they may experience Look at that word, true life. Paul writes this letter to Timothy to encourage him on what to teach his church. And so if you've ever been wondering why do churches talk about money, obviously God not only saw it as important because what we talked about last week was Jesus actually talks more about money than he does heaven and hell combined. Not only is it important for Jesus, but when Paul is trying to help a young church planter, a young pastor with what he's supposed to teach to his people, he goes, hey, you've got to make sure you teach them about money. You've got to make sure you talk to them about what it, they do with the money that they have. Other translations, instead of teach those who are rich, will say to challenge or to encourage. There's so many different words that could be used to communicate what Paul is alluding to. But what he is saying is that if it's not taught or challenged or if the people aren't compelled, those who are rich in this present world will do the wrong stuff with the money they've been given. Right. Some of us are in this space where because churches got so uncomfortable talking about money, now that we've become spiritually negligent, and so we don't have the information. You're misinformed or you're naive on what God has to say about money, so you're managing the things that he's entrusted you with according to the ways of the world. But God's Word has some great things for you and I to understand when it comes to the resources we have, and we're going to pull those from our text today. Here's the first thing. We've got to stop trusting in unreliable things. When Paul jumps into his encouragement to Timothy in verse 17, he says to teach those who are rich in this present world, which here's, here's the thing, you don't have to feel rich to be rich. Come on. Okay, I'm going to say it again because some of y'all just, you needed, that, you, you needed that this morning, right? Like some of you looking at your bank account and you, you know, you're working on one of them faith budgets. You don't have to feel rich to be rich. Amen. None of you. Cool. All right, we'll get there. I promise. Come on. You don't have to feel rich to be rich. So he says, for those who are rich in this present world, compel them to do something. They should not put their trust in money, which is so unreliable. Yeah. You ever had money let you down? Yeah. Right, we're in this space right now where uh, cryptocurrency is doing well again. <laughs> and I like cryptocurrency. I'm just going to be honest with you. I've been in it for, since like 2013, and, 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 and I love it. But every time we get into these cycles where, where things start going up, people get so excited. Like, oh, I'm going to turn $20 into $20 million, you know? And then what happens when the market dips again is you go, 
what happened? Because we put our hope in something that is so unreliable. God gave us the number one reason why we can't put our hope in our money or our trust in our money. It's because it's unreliable. Money is a great tool, but it makes a terrible God. Money is a tool that we should utilize. That's what Matthew 6, 24 would say, that, that you cannot serve both God and money because what will happen is you'll love one and despise the other. Yeah. Money is a great tool, but it makes a, a terrible master. How many times has money let you down before? Like, like putting our, our trust in our money. Um, I, I like to think of it like this. Uh, when you put your trust in your money, it's like putting your trust in windstream internet to be reliable. Anybody ever had that? Listen, I'm just going to be honest. Like 10 years ago when I was living in my parents' house, we had windstream. There, there was no conversation about gigabytes of internet. Like you were pulling three megabytes and you were happy. It was the only option at the time. And I remember like, like I would go, I would have to go to the library to do work and spend time because the, the Wi-Fi there was more reliable than what I had at the house, right? We've, we, we put our hope in things that are so unreliable. Wealth is fragile. It can disappear in a moment. It, it could be a bad investment that you made. It could be a lost job. It can be an economic downturn. And so Paul's warning for the people that Timothy is going to teach and lead and instruct is that while money is useful, it is not a solid foundation for security. Right. It's unreliable. We've got to quit putting our hope and trust in unstable foundations. True security is only found in God, who is both consistent and the ultimate provider of everything good. Amen. That's why as he continues on in the text, this is what it says. He doesn't say don't just to not trust your money. He gives you something else. So verse 17 in the second half of that verse says they shouldn't put their trust in money, which is so unreliable. Where should their trust go then? Their trust should be in God. So instead of trusting in your money, you have an alternative. The alternative is you begin to trust the Lord who gave you the money, and that's what he gets to next. Look at this. Who richly gives us all we need for our, come on, you can circle it and say it with me, enjoyment. If you are not enjoying the finances God has given you, you are settling for something inferior. Money is the number one reason why people get divorced. It's the number one argument you have. It's the number one tension in your life. And if you're not able to enjoy what God gave you, you have settled for less than his best. God gave you all this stuff for enjoyment, but most of us don't spend our lives enjoying the things he gave us. Instead, we spend our lives enslaved to something that was designed to be a tool. And so Paul's instruction for them is to trust God with your money. Why can you trust him with your money? Because he's the one who gave it to you. Right. Why can you trust God with your money? Because not only did he give it to you, but he gave it to you so that you could enjoy it. Yeah. So that you could have fun with it. So that you didn't have to be miserable financially. Many of us live that way. We're miserable no matter how much money we make. We got the raise, but then we went into more debt because money controls our lives. So you can tell in his letter to Timothy that Paul's trying to mentor him and teach them. He's saying, tell them. It's one of the things that we do when I sit down and chat with pastors. We'll coach them and go, hey, when you get in front of your people, tell them this. That's what Paul's saying Tell them to trust God with their money because he richly provides. And, and then he says this, tell them to use their money to do good. And, and you might be thinking, nobody's going to tell me what to do with my money. <laughs> but this is why we come back to God's word every time. Right. There is an internal struggle that we live in in the States, but, but it's, it's really a rebellion issue that lives within our heart. Where we get so entitled with the money we have, we don't realize it's become our God. And so when somebody gets in front of you and they open scripture with you and they go, God says to use your money to do good. You go, pastor just wants my money. 
No, no, no. This is God's word. If you don't agree with it, you take it up with the author, not the messenger. This is not a, 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 a money grab from you. This is God speaking to you to try and help you because he knows the thing that's going to cause tension in your life. He knows the thing that's going to bring arguments in your household. So he's going, I want to help you in this area. So Timothy, teach these people to use their money to do good. They should be rich in every way or rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. Here's the second thing for you. True wealth isn't found in what we hold, but in what we give. True wealth isn't found in what we hold, but what we give. You can have a big bank account. We talked about this last week. You can have a full house, but an empty heart. You and I can't be deceived to think that the goal of our lives and the reason why God put us on earth is to build a big bank account. It's not. It's to bankrupt hell and impact heaven. And so as we look at our finances, as we look at the things God has given us, Paul says, you've got to get these rich people, which they don't have to feel rich to be rich. You've got to tell these people who are rich in this present world to not put their trust in money. And you've got to teach them what to do with the money they've been given. And what that requires is for us to begin to shift our mind in the area of our finances. There's three mind shifts that I think I'm going to have to quit saying that word. My brain is just, my ADHD is killing me this morning. Let's hit the first one. God is the one who gave it to us. Therefore, he is the owner. You want to shift the things in your mind to, to understand biblical finances? This is going to be the first one. You're going to have to change. So, so, so Paul would say to Timothy that God richly gives us all things for our enjoyment. There's a big difference in being the owner, owner of something versus the manager of something. Yeah. When I'm the owner, I dictate what happens to it. When I'm the manager, I steward it according to the owner's heart. This is how our finances are to be approached. Here's the second thing. Uh, God expects me to manage and invest his money. And, and I'm not talking about the stock market or or, or cryptocurrency, or anything like that. We, we see this in the parable of, of the talents, where a master would come in, and before he left town, he left some with five, one with two, and one with a single bag of silver. And the text says there, each according to their abilities. Which means, uh, you can be mad at the financial position you're in, but why would God give you money you can't steward properly? So maybe instead of praying for increase, you pray for stewardship. Because he who's faithful with little will be entrusted with much. Right. It's biblical. This is what, so God expects me to manage it. So what happens in this parable is that the, the king returns, the master returns. And when he comes back, the guy who had five bags of silver had turned it into ten. The guy who had two bags of silver turned it into four. And the guy who had one bag of silver said, listen, master, I... I knew you were a harsh man, and, and so I buried your money. I'm going to be honest, though. If you look back, the, the fear that this guy operated in was not based on the, what we saw of the master. Because I don't know how many friends you got, but before my boss leaves town, they don't typically leave me with bags of silver. Yeah. Oh, he's generous. <laughs> he, he, he leaves them there. And so this person who just invested the money or buried the money in the ground, the master goes, you're, you wicked and lazy servant. Why didn't you put it in the bank so I would have at least gained interest on it? Right. And for some of us, we've bought into this lie in the, in, the, in the American church that all God is after is faithfulness. It's not. That guy was really faithful with his money. Yeah. If I left you with one bag of silver, you buried it in the ground, you gave me one bag, bag of silver when I came back, I was incredibly faithful with it. But God doesn't want you to just be faithful. He wants you to be fruitful. The two are interconnected. He designed you. He didn't say in Genesis chapter 2 for you to go be faithful and multiply. He said be fruitful and multiply. He wants faithfulness, but he also wants fruitfulness. He wants you to use the stuff that he's given you. It matters. So Paul in this would say teach those people to use their money for good. God expects you to invest his money. And the third thing is that God has blessed me so that I can be a blessing to others. God has blessed me so that I can be a blessing to others. 
One of the primary reasons why we, we, we give people budgets and we teach them how to budget is because some of you aren't prepared to be generous. <laughs> Can we go back to the verse really quick? I've only got 14 minutes left. Apparently, I got way more to teach on today. Than... Look at this, verse, verse 18. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need. Look at this. Always being ready to share with those in need. The reason why you need a budget and the reason why you need to plan is so that if an opportunity presents itself, you're ready to serve those who have a need. This is what it looks like to be a good steward of the resources that God has entrusted you with. God has blessed me so that I can be a blessing. And we do this even as a church. I'm going to lift this up real quick. That rock was a little heavier than I thought. So as we look at this as a church, even, we, uh, we strategically budget. It's why whenever we have disaster relief and we do all those things, we don't have to go and raise money to go send stuff. We can write two, three, four, five, even $10,000 checks like that because of the way we strategically budget to be ready to give to those in need. God designed you to live that exact same way. If a need appeared, are you ready to write a check for it? Because stewardship is preparation. And I think the way that I like to look at this in my own finances is uh, whether I am a rock or a sponge. And so this uh, pitcher of water is going to represent the cash or, or, or the resources that God has entrusted you with, right? God gives it to us for our enjoyment. Come on, some of y'all real blessed, right? Put a little more in there. And so there's a big difference, though, between a rock and a sponge. A rock is going to sit in the water. And rocks actually, even though it might not look like it, do have the ability to absorb a little bit of the water. But if I go and lift this rock up and I go to transfer what God has given me into this other container, which would represent the world, uh, I didn't leave a really big impact. There are a few drops of water in this other container. If I'm a rock, all I'm doing is soaking up what God has given me. And when I soak up what God has given me, it'll be there for my enjoyment. It'll be there to get me out of a drought, but it will never do more than serve me. Instead, God didn't design you to be a rock. He actually designed you to be a sponge in the area of your finances. And what I love about a sponge is that a sponge has a completely different gift set. A sponge is designed for one purpose, to transfer something from one space to another. If I'm a sponge, I get to soak up everything that God has given me, but I also get to be a delivery mechanism to the rest of the world and transfer what God has entrusted me with. So I'm not just hoarding what I've been given. Instead, I'm transferring what my owner has entrusted me with. Instead of using it just to serve me, instead of using it just for what I've got going on, I'm saying, hey, God, you've blessed me with it. And if you want to use it in some other area, I'm not a rock that can't transfer where I'm going to be cold and hard. No, instead, when you say, hey, there's a need, I want you to fulfill it. I'm ready to transfer what God has entrusted me with. This is the difference. Are you a rock or are you a sponge in your finances? Are you somebody that just hoards and soaks up and, and keeps it all for yourself? Or are you in the position where you're going, God, I want to get what you've given me to the people you know that yeah. need it. Right. There's a big difference. Acts 20, 35 says, In all things I've shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, look at this, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Rocks are just going to sit there in their surroundings. But a sponge soaks up and delivers. And, and what's really cool about it is if you notice, as you transfer from one container to the other, I've created more space for God to pour in 
with the container he's entrusted me with. And this is how finances work. This is what it looks like to build God's kingdom this way. Are you going to sit in what God has given you? Or will you become a delivery vehicle to bless the world? And what I love is that we are a church of sponges. We are a church full of so many people who take what God has given them and are using it to make a difference. And I'm not just talking about with money. I'm talking about with the resources and, and things like lake houses and, and vehicles and, and gifts and talents. There's, there's people in our church right now who serve so sacrificially. Like I was talking to a, a guy the other week. I know he works on like 15 people's cars. And the reason why he does it is because God gave him the gift. It's not even his occupation now, but he's got the resources to be able to do it. So he leverages what God has entrusted him with because he's a sponge, not a rock. Right. It's not about an amount you give. It's about the stewardship of what you've been entrusted with. What will you do with what God has given you? This is Paul's challenge for Timothy as he teaches the people in, those church, in the church to compel them to be rich in this present world, to do good things. And then verse 19 of chapter 6 says this, By doing this, they will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they might experience true life. By doing this, what is this? All the stuff that Paul's just talked about. Not putting their trust in money. Instead, putting their trust in God. Choosing to use their money to do good. Enjoying the things that God has given them. Doing good works in the world. By doing those things with their money, they're storing up treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they might experience true life. And when we look at the, the, the words there that are used for true life, it's got dual meaning. It's not just talking about eternity. Now, there are some times when people talk about money in the church where it gets so eternity-focused that you think you don't get to enjoy any of it now. But the text would teach us something different. God gave it to you for what? Your enjoyment. So this is not just talking about eternity where you get to enjoy your finances. The reason why you do good with the things that God has given you is that you are honoring him. And by honoring him in the area of your finances, you are storing up treasures in heaven. Your reward in eternity is going to be great. But you also get to store up for yourself a good foundation for a better future here on this earth. The people who experience the greatest joy and happiness in life are those who are the most generous. Those who are stingy and close-fisted and angry in the area of their finances all the time do not get to experience the joy that comes from enjoying what God has given you because you're so focused on not losing it. God designed you to invest more than just every bit of your energy into not losing the money you've been given. He designed you to live for more than just paycheck to paycheck. He, in, he designed you to enjoy your money as a tool, not a God. Right. That's the last thing for you this morning is this, is that rich in God's eyes. Rich in God's eyes means rich in good deeds, not dollars. Being rich in God's eyes. It's not about how many zeros are in your bank account. Being rich in God's eyes it is not about how much money you make or how many hours you work. Scripture talks about being rich in good deeds. And I think part of that is other passages of Scripture say this, uh, he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. I don't have the ability to give because I just don't have enough. Here, if the Lord is leading you to do something, He has already provided what you need to cover what He calls. But a lot of times we ask God to bless something that He's not even in control of. What does it look like for your life to be rich in good deeds? To leverage everything for the kingdom. I'm not just talking about money. Some of you, that's the step, right? And we, we, we teach on money for this reason because 
Paul's instruction to Timothy was to say, hey, there's people in your church who are rich in this present world and they're not honoring God with their money. Instead, they're controlled by it. And the way to break that is they would begin to trust God, not money. So we teach that. But there are some of you too that need to step past just financial stewardship and get into life stewardship. Because I know incredibly wealthy people that will use money as an excuse not to use their gifts to build God's kingdom. And we think writing a paycheck or writing a check covers that. We see the opposite happen too. We see people like, I ain't got no money, but I just give my time. No, no, no. God wants stewardship in every area of your life. If he gave it to you, he wants to use it to build his kingdom. What if you started viewing everything in your life through that lens that God could literally use every single thing in your life to build and glorify Him? What if He gave you that car for a reason? What if He gave you that house for a reason? What if He gave you those skill sets for a reason? I was talking to a buddy of mine the other week who runs a program out of Winston-Salem. And what they do, he's been a, a hunter his entire life. He loves hunting, but they've noticed that, that there are a lot of kids that don't have dads and, and, and they'll never get to go hunting in their childhood. So he, he runs an entire nonprofit that just takes kids hunting and they go take and they, they get their first deer or turkey or all of this stuff. And, and through that process, they teach them what it looks like to actually trust God as a father because they don't have one themselves. That's leveraging your gifts. That's making a difference with what God has entrusted you with. It doesn't have to be as complicated as we make it. You don't have to touch a stage to do it, although some of you need to. Because some of you have gifts that you're not using. Some of you have the capacity to sing and play instruments and do all these things, and you're not using your gifts, and you're not honoring God with the things he's given you. Are you being a good steward of what he's entrusted you with? This is what this series is all about. Is instead of trusting in accumulation, we trust in God. Instead of trusting in being rich in this world, we're going to trust in God who will make us rich beyond all of our imagination because what Scripture teaches us is that all of the riches are wrapped up in Christ. You know, the greatest gift God gave you was His Son. And this is why we teach generosity here at Propel Church. The number one reason why you should be generous is because God Himself is generous. John 3, 16, it's it's so clear. For God so loved the world that he gave. Isn't it interesting that we would know God's love because of what he would give? And yet sometimes when we get into church, somebody starts talking about our money, we go, what, what what if what you gave was to honor the Lord in that same way? Like that you show your love back to God through what you trust him with, which is the thing that he entrusted you with. For some of you in the room, you have trusted money to be your Lord and Savior. And as I said multiple times, money is a great tool, but it makes a terrible God. If you put your hope in money, if you put your hope in stuff, if you put your hope in being rich, there is no amount of money that can cover the sin debt that's on your life. That's why God generously gave us his son. That's why he loved us so much he would give everything. And so Jesus would come and he would live a sinless life to die in our place so that in him we could experience life and life abundantly. So with every head bowed, every eye closed around the room, there's some of you in here today who need to begin a relationship with Jesus. If that's you, would you just lift your hand for a moment? Say, I want to make that decision. Here's what we're going to do, church. Nobody prays alone. We all pray together. Will you repeat this after me? Dear Jesus, today I give you my life. I place my hope and trust in you. Thank you for dying in my place so that I could have new life. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Thank you so much for joining us at Propel Church today. My name is Pastor Nick Newman, and on behalf of myself and our whole team here, we are so grateful that you chose to engage with our worship experience today and hear God's word. We would love to help you take a next step, but the only way we can do that is if you engage with us. So do us a favor, go to propel.church. If you feel led to uh, take a next step today, our website will walk you through that. And if you feel led to give, you can click the giving tab to partner with us financially to continue to impact Mount Pleasant and the surrounding areas for Jesus.